Thank you. So, um, thanks. Thank you. Um, very uh, excited to be here tonight, talk to you guys. Um, we've come a long way, so uh, thank you for coming out here to meet us tonight. Um, as uh, Nancy said, we've been coming to Croatia for a long time, and uh, it's always good to be here. And uh, we're just thankful that you guys came out tonight. So, tonight we're going to talk about the idea of core values. Um, as he said, we're going to talk a little bit about what happened at Delta, which is my company. Um, I'm going to share some personal stuff that happened to me along the way through all of this as well. And so, um, so we'll talk a little bit about what's going on at Delta, but really, once we get past that, I want to talk about you guys and um, how can you develop core values for your own success, right? So ultimately, what good does it do for us to talk about some American companies if we don't somehow have some application? So, Hopefully we'll get to that point and you guys will be encouraged and maybe even inspired a little bit if we get to that point. So, um, and I have this uh, changer right here so I can control my own slides, which is excellent. So, we're going to start out with three elephants, which is weird because we're going to talk about core values and um, why wouldn't we start with elephants? This is uh, So, we're from Gainesville and it turns out that the uh, high school that is in Gainesville, Georgia, in the United States where we live, the mascot is a red elephant. So there's one elephant. The second elephant is uh, just a random elephant in the water. And the reason why I have this elephant up here is because the elephant in the room is this. And I want to make sure that I'm clear with this right off the bat. I'm not Croatian, okay? So anytime an American shows up in Croatia and starts trying to tell people, this is how we do it in America, pay attention, it's arrogant, okay? So I'm not going to do that, or I'm going to try not to do that, all right? I want you to understand that I have great respect for the Croatian people, and the things that I'm gonna to say tonight are true to all people, not just Croatians or Americans, okay? So I'm gonna address you as human beings, not as any specific nationality. So I just wanna make sure that we're clear about that. Does that make sense? I don't wanna come across as, just as how we do it in America, so listen up. That's not what I'm saying, okay? This, things that I'm saying tonight apply to us. The Americans are sitting in here in a room just as well as they do for any Croatian students, okay? The third elephant is this idea of objective truth. So there is a, um, there's an old story. Um, this comes back from ancient days. Um, it's a, actually a Hindu parable about an elephant. And I want to talk about this for a second, just to be the third elephant. This was, uh, I first came, uh, I became aware of this old parable through a, um, through a poem. There's an English an Englishman that wrote a poem, his name was Sax, S-A-X-E. In the 19th century, he wrote this poem about seven blind men from Endostan, or Indostan, and this elephant, or six blind men, I guess not six, not seven. And so the story of this, this parable goes like this. Um, there were six blind men from Indostan, and they each came up to sample the elephant. And you can see from these guys right here, the first one walked up and he touched the tusk of the elephant. And he saw that it felt, and he said, Huh, I, an elephant must be like a spear, because that was his experience. The second one um, grabbed the tusk and said, an elephant is just like a snake. The third one grabbed the, the ear of the elephant and said, the elephant is like a fan. The fourth one grabbed the trunk of the, the, the elephant's leg, just like a trunk of a tree. Then the fifth said, grabbed the side, obviously said it's a wall. And then the last guy grabbed the tail and said, it's a rope. And so the moral of the story from this guy, Sax, is that all of the blind men from Indistan were equally right and equally wrong. So they were equally right that they were describing a part of an elephant, but they're all wrong because they don't see the whole elephant. And part, some people have interpreted this parable to mean that human beings from different areas or different cultures can't really understand the truth because they have to look at it with their own blindness, with their own feelings, right? They look at it and so, a, so for example, a Croatian may grab the leg of the elephant and say, this truth is like, this elephant is like a a tree, or an American might grab a tail and say it's like a rope, or someone from Peru might grab and say it's like a spear. So there's, because we have different perspectives and different ways of looking at things, we can't really see what is objective truth. Okay? So I would like to blow that up and say right now, it's still an elephant. Okay? You may not be able to see because of your, because of some um, prejudices or some, um, some experiences that you had may not be able to see, or some lack of knowledge for us too. Some lack of knowledge may be able to see the whole truth, but the whole truth is still there. There still is objective truth. It still does exist. We just our perceptions of it may not be complete. 
So, and then there's, we can talk about this more later on, but I just want to get, put that idea out there. And I'm going to talk tonight with several, what I call metaphors, word pictures, that will be easy to remember and talk about over coffee later on or, or pizza as well. So, um, let's see here, next slide. All right, this is me, these are, these are the shots that Patty makes me put up here. So, I'm going to talk just for a minute um, about what I do. Not because I really want to tell you about what I do, but because it gives me at least a little bit of credibility why I'm standing up here and all that stuff. So this is my office. I would much rather be at 35,000 feet and 500 knots right now, um, flying an airplane than sitting up here and talking from you. Well, not really, but I mean, I really do love being up there, okay? So these are the shots. I am a captain at Delta Airlines. Uh, I've been working at Delta for 23 years. Um, I am a, um, a lead line check pilot, and um, this is an ASAP ERC debriefer, which I will talk about in a little bit. But there's a picture of me in my office, and in the simulator, um, there's that. All right, I'm going to start back with a little bit of story about myself, okay? And again, I'm not telling you this because I'm particularly enamored of the story, but it kind of helps unpack some of the rest of the information. I went to college, and I'll start with when I went to college. I went to college at the Coast Guard Academy. It's a military school in the United States. So military schools have lots of fun things that are associated with them, including a lot of yelling, um, a lot of push-ups, a lot of running around. Um, they really try and cram into these ideas of leadership, discipline, and um, leadership, discipline, and um, honor. Okay, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit too. So, um, I enjoyed my time there. I got to go on this boat. This is the Eagle. It's a nice ship that I got to sail on when I was there. So I enjoyed my four years at the Academy. And I'll refer to it as the Academy from now on for reference, but it was the United States Coast Guard Academy. Very fun experience that I had there. But I have some things we'll talk about that came from that time. So um, Coast Guard Academy. While I was at the Coast Guard Academy, I had my first experience with mathematics. Okay, so we're going to talk about values a little bit today. So values really have a lot to do with the way we see the world, okay? And for me, one of the very, as I came out of high school and started into college, mathematics was a way that I began to see the world, okay? It's very interesting to me. Um, and I can see this now maybe a little bit better than I could see at the time. But for me, mathematics, I like a couple of things about it. First of all, the one thing I like about mathematics is that it's either right or wrong. Okay, now, when I was in college, I was very thankful that there was a thing called partial credit. I don't know if you guys have this in class for you guys. So you could get the problem wrong, but if you did it the right way, your teacher might give pity on you. And so in my, some of the classes I had, I could make a 35 out of 100, and that would be a B. Right? So there was this idea that partial credit was a good thing for us. So, but I do like the idea that mathematics is it's either right or it's wrong. It's objective truth. Right? You can, it's not subjective. It's, it, it is what it is. The second thing that I, that I like about mathematics is that, um, that it comes, that it's, and I'm trying to put this, is mathematics is um, not something that we have, um, that it's something that we've discovered, okay? It's not something that we've created or invented. In some ways we have, but it actually lines up with what's going on in the universe, right? So there's this idea that math lives and we can find mathematics in the universe as we look around. So it's, it's not just something that we've created, but it matches up with the way the world works. Okay, so two things um, about mathematics that I like is, are those. All right, here we go. Moving right along. All right, I graduated from the academy and I spent, this is what the Coast Guard does. Again, just a real quick slide. They do all these different things. I did that for 10 years. So I graduated from school, spent 10 years in the Coast Guard. And helicopters, what I did was I flew airplanes. So I flew, started, went to flight training, and I started flying these uh, big uh, Coast Guard C-130s, doing search and rescue missions. I did that for 10 years. I did it in Alaska, Florida, um, around the world. Several thousand hours of flying these things. Have a lot of great stories. If you'd like to talk about those, some of these are stories I'd like to talk about, but not tonight. All right. In 1996, I left the Coast Guard, got hired by Delta Airlines. Um, my first 10 to 11 years, I was a regular line pilot through the line all over the world, uh, Europe, South America, Asia all over the United States, um, really enjoy being a pilot, okay? Since then, I've done some other things, and again, we'll get to that, well, I guess I'll talk about this now. Um, about 11, 12 years ago, I uh, became a line instructor, okay? So a line instructor, what, just as it may be interesting to you, when, and this is for all airlines, when a pilot finishes training in the simulator, okay, the first time they touch an airplane, it has people in the back, okay? so. 
training, training, training in the simulator, I'm going to the airplane, I'm going to go fly it. So they need to have somebody that flies with them. So as a pilot, what I, my job as a line check pilot was I'll fly with these guys for the first 20 hours in the airplane until they are ready to go and then they'll be released and then they'll fly the line. But they need somebody to go with them for their first about 20 hours to make sure that they are good to go. That's kind of what I do as a line check pilot. Line check pilots also administer checks to make sure that the pilots are up to speed and doing what they're supposed to be doing. But it's a leadership position, okay? I did that for a couple of years and then I was asked to become a lead line check pilot. And so a lead line check pilot supervises line check pilots. So for example, at Delta there's about almost 15,000 pilots. There's about 500 guys who are line check pilots and about 40 guys who are lead line check pilots. So I've been a lead line check pilot for the last seven years. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of where in the hierarchy of pilots that I've matched up. The last interesting thing is we'll talk about this is that for the last two new airplanes that Delta has brought into their fleet, and Delta has 12, air, 12 different fleet types, over 850 airplanes, it's a big organization. The last two new airplanes that we brought into the fleet, 717 and AP20, I got to be a lead line check pilot and build those teams from the ground up, which is really an exciting thing to do to build a team of pilots or any team, really to build a team and then have the team take something and take off with it, really literally take off, you know, off the ground with, with, the, with these teams. So really an exciting um, thing to be part of. Um, moving right along here, the last fleet, in fact, we just got our first A220 um, in uh, October. And so we have nine of them now that are in service. And so 25 line check pilots out doing their job training over 100 pilots in the last couple of months. Um, this is kind of a big deal. And this man on the left, is our is Delta CEO Ed Bastion, and of course that's me on the right. In the very first airplane on the way to coming back to Atlanta, he the CEO actually said, "Hey Jim, can I get my picture with you?" <laughs> that's not how it happened. No, it was the other way. So, no, he did not say that. It's a joke. So I just want to make sure you guys are awake. No, so we got this picture here before we brought the airplane. He came back with us. We flew their first airplane back to Atlanta. All right, Delta Airlines, Atlanta, Georgia, Fortune Global 500 company, 40 plus billion dollar. That's great. 850 airplanes, 80,000 employees, 15,000 daily flights, 53. It's big. It's a big air. It's a big company. All right. It's and it, when they make changes, it takes a while for things to happen. It just does. Okay. So it's it's a big company and it flies all over the world. You can see Africa, South America, Australia, Europe. Not Zagreb yet. Well, you guys have a nice airport, but like to fly here, but we're not coming here yet. All right. So. This is the whole deal where we fly, and that's all exciting, and um, that's what we do. So, all right, next. All right, so as I said last night, what happened was, probably about seven or eight years ago, the, um, I had a, uh, a manager, not a pilot, but a manager said to me, Jim, um, I got a question for you. I said, okay. He said, this, is, this would be an easy one. Are we a rules-based company or a values-based company? And I said, well, this is an obvious, the answer is obvious to me. I fly airplanes and there's a million rules. If you like thinking there's car rules for driving cars, there's way more rules for driving airplanes. The FAA watches us what we do. We have, we have um, checks that we have to do. There's, there's um, all these procedures that we have to follow with precision. People pay us a lot of money to make sure that we operate these airplanes safely. Of course we're a rules-based organization. He said, not anymore. We're going to become a values-based organization. And I'm like, Really, we're going to become a values-based organization. What's going to happen? Does that mean that we will now go like this? Have fun, fly safe? No. <laughs> the rules don't go away. He said, no, the rules aren't going away, but we're going to change the way we look at things. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? So basically what we had have, have before is this idea that here's the rules, you follow the rules, this is what you do. If there wasn't any rules, nobody really addressed what you're supposed to do. So lots of things, there's not enough rules that could really discuss every possible scenario that could come up. So there was gaps in the, in the rule book of what we were supposed to do. Things would occur, we wouldn't, there was nothing to do, so we would just kind of, we would just make it up. And they said, well, no, here's the deal. Rules-based cultures emphasize, establish, emphasize establishing an extensive set of rules that govern behavior. That's how we work, okay? What they're saying now is, what he said now to us, in values-based cultures, the goal is to instill in the enterprise a common set of values that guide individuals' behaviors. Do the rules go away? Nope. The rules are still there. But 
kind of look at it, I kind of try to think about it like this. The rules are like a brick wall without mortar, right? Or there, there's bricks all over the place, and you kind of you get around the rules because there's things called loopholes in rules, right? There's ways to get around the rules. When you have values, it kind of firms up the wall, and all of a sudden, all the light, all the loopholes in the wall go away because now you have this. We call this the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. When I have a rule, set of rules, I can look at it and go, well, it doesn't say I can't do this. I'm in. When it says be honest or have integrity, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, that's hard, right? I can't really have integrity and and not do this. And we'll talk about some of the specifics of what this looks like. So we changed our culture. Or try to change our culture. Now, changing a culture is not an easy thing to do, especially for 80,000 people, especially when a lot of people have been doing their job for a long time and are like, what do you mean we're values-based? We're rules-based. Are you kidding me? So this was not necessarily met with great enthusiasm, excitement. We're kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, here we go again, another thing. And have fun, fly safe, sure. So now, before I get into talking about the Delta um, core values that we're going to talk about, we need to do is we need to define some terms, right? So in school, when you guys talk about things, there is the idea of we need to make sure that the language that we use, that we understand what we're talking about. Paradigms is the first one we're going to talk about, okay? A paradigm is a model theory or perception. It's the way that you see things, it's the way I see things, it's the way people look at the world, okay? Sometimes our paradigms aren't right. Sometimes they're incorrect. So this is an example of a paradigm. So we came to Zagreb this week. And believe it or not, we needed a map to find our way to where the gelato shops were. We did not know off the top of our head how to get there. Okay? The problem is, with the map, guess what? We successfully navigated our way and were able to eat gelato at Vintic and Millennium like that, because we had good maps. Okay? A paradigm is a map is like a map. Okay, if you have a good map, you can get where you're going. If we had come here and showed up at the hotel and they gave us maps of split, how much luck would we have had finding the gelato shops in Zara? Not much. Would have been it would have not been good. We would not would have found, we, we might have found them, but it would have been blind luck. And it wouldn't matter how hard we looked at the map, how hard we tried, how much effort we put into it, how much we worked together. If we got a bad map, we're not gonna be able to get to find the gelato. And if we do, it's just random, just a random chance of happening. Most likely, it's not, not going to work. Okay. So a paradigm is this idea of a it's a model, a theory, perception. Okay. It's the way we see the world. So that's kind of I want to make sure that we understand what a paradigm is. So I'm going to use that language. All right. So here's an example. If you guys have seen this before, maybe you haven't. All right. Take a look at this. What do you see? We've got, who's seen this before? Raise your hand if you've seen this picture before. Everybody's seen this before. Who do you see when you look at this? Who sees the young girl? Raise your hand if you see the young girl. Who sees the old lady? Who can see, who can see both? Who can see both? Okay. Because if you've seen this before, you can kind of pick it out. If you haven't seen it, it's kind of weird, right? Because you're looking at it and you go, well, it's obviously it's a young lady. But then if you look at it, can anybody not see the old, the old lady? You can't see, can anyone not see the old lady? All right, I got this fancy corner here. Right, let's make sure that everyone can see this. All right. So here's the young girl. She's got a feather in her hat. Here's her eyes, she's looking away, here's her nose, here's her ear, and here's her chin, right? You guys see that? Okay. The old lady, this is her eye, this is an eye, this is her nose, right here coming down. This is her mouth that's open. This is her shoulder, shoulder, you see that? You guys see that? Okay, so it may take a while. Alright? I promise you the old lady is there. And people, can somebody some people can see the old lady? Alright? Okay, so this is when he's, ch it's, it's, it's kind of like, it, you can't see it, you can't see it. This is an idea of a paradigm. When you see it, that's a paradigm shift. Can you see it, Patrick? Okay. <laughs> we'll look at, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time with this, but if you get the general idea, a paradigm shift is when you can't see something, all of a sudden, oh, I can see that. It's a paradigm shift, right? It's a, what, you're looking at it one way, and all of a sudden you see it in a different way. All of a sudden, you had to, you got a good map to see the old thing. Can't see it yet. You see it now? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, make sense? All right, very good, very good. Next slide. All right, I'm going to read this out. So each of us has many, many maps in our head, okay? They can divide them into two main categories, maps of the way things are. Okay, so we have a map of Zagreb. There's a way, it is a physical map. We know what Zagreb looks like. 
it is a physical reality, all right? Okay? Or realities, and there's maps of things that, of the way things should be or values, okay? We interpret everything we experience through these mental maps. We seldom question their accuracy. We're usually able to aware that we have that we have. We simply assume that the way we see things is the way they really are or the way that they should be. Sometimes our mental maps are wrong. Okay, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through here too. All right, so, all right, so first, so with the ideas we've talked about so far is the idea of paradigms, and we're starting to talk about values. Okay, before we go too far with values, we need to throw into this idea of principles. Okay, so principles, they are ideas, they are things that govern human effectiveness. Natural laws in the human dimension are just as real, just as unchanging. And arguably there as laws such as gravity are in a physical dimension. There are certain things about human beings that are principle-centered paradigms. So, for example, if you are honest, okay, that is a principle-centered paradigm. If you are dishonest, you are going to get yourself in trouble. Eventually. Maybe not right now, but eventually people do not like dishonest people. It's hard to work with them. It's hard to do business with them. It's hard to be friends with them. If people are going to lie to you consistently... You're probably not going to hang out with them very long. It's not good for personal relationships if you're a liar. Okay? So honesty is a principle-centered paradigm. Just like jumping out of a building and having gravity work on you, if you're a continual liar, you're going to have some problems in human relationships. Does that make sense? So honesty is a principle-centered paradigm. Okay? Well, bear with me on this. We're getting through this stuff. Sorry, I'll right here. All right, so for example, right in this picture over here, we have the sail we have the sailboat, not the eagle that I was talking about before and a lighthouse. So the story goes like this. Two battleships are out at sea in the Mediterranean, and they are doing a, uh, some exercises, okay? And it's foggy, so they can't really see each other, all right? And so eventually, one of the battleships sees a light, and the light is coming right up, and they're steaming right towards each other, and so they tell the other battleship, hey, turn, and you know, and the guy calls back on the radio and says, yeah, I'm not turning. Can't turn. Not going to turn. He goes, no, you need to turn. I'm bigger than you. You need to turn. And the guy says, back to him again, no, I'm not going to turn. I'm a lighthouse. Okay, he hasn't found any other battleship, but he's found as a lighthouse. So the idea is that sometimes, again, this is a paradigm shift. Sometimes you're steaming towards something and you want it to change, and then you realize it's a lighthouse. If you don't move, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to what? Hit the rocks. That's bad, okay? Principle center paradigms are the idea that these, these principle center paradigms are things that if you don't comply with them, it's going to leave a mark, all right? So, we're moving right along here. All right, there's an expression that we have in Georgia where I live, and that will leave a mark, all right? So there are certain things that you can do in life that will leave a mark. So I'm going to give you some examples, all right? When I was in high school, I got my teeth knocked out, or one of my teeth knocked out playing football. It's still gone. It's not the bruise and everything back there. It's still gone. I broke my hand. Every once in a while, I hold this mic very long, my hand will start tingling. So there's something that left the mark inside of it. I show this picture right here. This is a watertight door. Okay? It's on a ship. So when I was at the academy, I was on a ship one summer, and I was late, and I was running through the ship to try and make it for my watch. And I was running very fast, and I was hurtling through these doors. Because you can see there's about a foot and a half. As you, as you run, you would have to step through the door, right? But you would also have to duck at the same time. Because if you didn't, <laughs> your head would hit the top. <laughs> you already know what happened. <laughs> I was running as fast as I could, and I did not duck low enough. And my head hit the rate that, that very top of that thing at about 15 miles an hour. And my feet went straight out, and it landed flat on my back, unconscious. That will leave a mark, okay? I, uh, I woke up groggy, blood in my eyes, and I have a really cool scar that goes right here that was given by a really bad corpsman who gave me Frankenstein stitches, which thankfully I still have a little bit of hair on top so that you don't get to look at my, people think I might have had a lobotomy or something. So <laughs> that will leave a mark, okay? So. Let me talk another, tell another story about, um, I want to talk about values a little bit and another um, story because 
uh, these things can become a little, they can be get, a little, get a little confusing, all right? So at this school that I went to, they were very serious about this. In fact, this is on the floor. When you walk into the main building of the school, you look down, it's got this idea that says, he who lives here reveres honor and honors duty. That's a very serious statement, and it's emblazoned right on the floor of the academy when you walk in. This is a value, right? And if there's any doubt about it, they put it on the floor. When you walk in, you got to read it. You can't escape it. And it's everywhere. This is the motto. It's everywhere you go around there, this is the thing, all right? So the Coast Guard Academy, the academy has, as one of their primary values, is this idea of honesty, okay? If you look at the rest of this, they say you cannot lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate anyone who does. They're very serious about this. Okay, this is an important value for the Coast Guard Academy. They want their guys to tell the truth. Okay, fair enough. The other thing that they teach very strongly is this idea of teamwork, camaraderie, working together, so that when you come through this thing for four years, by the end, the guys that you have gone through for four years are your brothers. Right, so they want you to work together this idea of loyalty. And these are competing, can become competing values. Both of them are excellent values, but here's where the problem comes in. By the time I was in my fourth year, so I was a senior at the academy, I had risen up into a position of leadership at the school. And one of my classmates, my good friends, um, had, a, had a girlfriend who he managed to get pregnant before we graduate, okay? The problem is, you can't be married and be at the academy. It's a rule, you can't be married and, and be there. But he got her pregnant and felt like the right thing to do was to marry her, so he did, before our senior year, okay? So as we go through the year, we have to fill out forms for graduation that say what our, what our marital status is. And there are a number of guys that are around that know that this, this friend of mine, this dude, is married. And so he's filling out paperwork that is falsified. He's lying. But he's our brother. So you have competing values, both of which are good. What do you do? How do you handle that? What would you do? Right? So you're so I'm in a position of leadership. I haven't reported him, but his been, but the report has come up and now it's on my desk and I have to decide what I'm looking And it's not for me to decide, I have to make action on it, but it's eventually it's going to go to the board that will decide his fate and what he has to do. Okay, so sometimes these values, now this is a very painful thing because this is, you know, you can imagine this kind of situation. How do you, how do you manage competing values that, that are both are important, both valued by the organization? How do you manage that? This, this is kind of, this is kind of a different kind of model. Right? It's not necessarily a wound on my head, but a wound that kind of affects you, you know, as you go through life and how you handle things, how you look at things. Okay? So values are important, and they're not always cut clean and cut dry as they should be. Okay? So the idea what they wanted to enforce with us was honesty and integrity. Right? That was a value. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a way of processing things, but it's not always easy. Okay? I'll tell you another story. Um, this is not necessarily a academy story, but it's another story that affected me. It's kind of a personal story. Again, it's a value thing. In my younger days, while I was at the academy, and even when I graduated and I first started flying and doing those things, I was married and had children. Okay? But what I found in, through my life, and my life experience up to that point, was that um, if I did things and I worked hard, then I would get the right results. Okay, so if I was if I studied, I got good grades. If I worked hard, then I was, did well in the, in the athletic field. If I was good with interpersonal relationships, I got greater leadership positions at the academy. No matter what I did, if I put the right effort in, there was results. When I wanted to date a girl, I would I would put the effort in, and I could date the girl. There was I had really didn't have any problems. I was one of those annoying guys that everything seems to work well for him, right? But in my mind, it was that things were working well because I was putting in the effort. And this was reinforced by my parents who told me, if you want anything in your life, you're going to have to work hard to get it. Okay, well, that seems to be working. So no matter what I did, it's always seemed to, to work out for me. I, again, no, it's just the way it was. 
So my paradigm, my, my paradigm of the way the world worked was, as long as I work hard and do the right thing, everything would be great. Until it wasn't. Okay? So when I was 33, so a little bit older than you guys, when I was 33, my wife at the time had an affair and got pregnant, which led to a divorce, which was not the way my paradigm worked. The way I understood things, the way I perceived the world, I had a paradigm shift because I was doing the right things, but I was not getting the results I wanted anymore. This is another example of a paradigm shift. Okay? The way I see things, it is not working. Okay? You have to readjust, you have to refigure, you have to figure out a new paradigm. What, what works? Okay, so for me this was a huge thing because it caused me to question everything and reevaluate. What, if this paradigm is junk, it doesn't work, I'm, at, I'm done. Now I didn't think about it in these terms, I wasn't like, I need a new paradigm. I was trying to figure out, what the heck, How, what do I do now? How do I figure this out? So for me, this was a time in my life where I had to really kind of stop and say, how does things, how do things work? How, how do I manage this? What, how? So I can talk about that more at length, but for me, this was a huge moment in my life. It left a mark, big time. But it also caused me to reevaluate stuff, and it was a huge moment of faith for me, a perception of the way I look at the world and in my Christian faith. Okay, so keep that in mind, but that's a transition that occurred to me in my prayer. Alright. Rules of the road. Alright, so we finally get to the point where we've been we're trying to get to. I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of an idea. So you guys are good with the idea of what I'm talking about with paradigms. I'll give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. So Delta has come out with these rules of the road now. These are, they're very specific, very detailed with these, and um, we're gonna take a look at those uh, in just a moment. Um, roughly, like I said, rules of the road. We'll look at them. Here they are, Delta's core values. So there they are, and we'll talk about each, each one of these a little bit specifically as we go through honesty, always tell the truth, Integrity, always keep your deals. Respect, don't hurt anyone. Perseverance, try harder than all our competitors, never give up. And servant leadership, care for our customers, our community, and each other. So it's interesting that some of these are kind of internal. Like, honestly, it's kind of an internal thing, but it does affect your customers, right? Some of them are very external. Um, respect, um, servant leadership. Um, so there, it's interesting, and the order is interesting, but that's... There's where they are, and they're, very, they're, they're kind of oriented with a very business lead, business kind of, um, you know, sub-sense there. Always keep your deals, don't hurt anybody. It's kind of got a business sense to it, which is good, I think, because it's obviously just a, it's a business thing. So these are values, okay? Now, let's make sure I want to make sure that we understand this. Values versus principles. These are actually principles, okay? They're core principles, so if you're not honest, if you don't have integrity, if you don't have respect, you're gonna crash on the rocks. You're gonna get mark, you're gonna leave a mark. Somewhere you're gonna get a mark on you from that. I mean, it's just that's what it is. It's just they're human, they're human <coughs> principles. What Delta has done is they have aligned their values, core values, with basic human principles. Okay, so you can say these are their our values, but they're also just having to line up with the principles. If you don't do these things, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for our pastors. It's going to be a problem for you. You may lose your job. Okay. So, one thing I wanted to point out about these um, is, so I'm a pilot, and I work with pilots. Okay. And so, we look at this, five, this list of five things, and there's two that stand out to me. Because these are the two that I deal with all the time with pilots. Line check pilots and regular pilots. Anybody want to take a guess at which two they are that pilots seem to have a hard time with? What would you guess? Anyone want to take a stab at that? What is it? Not honesty. Okay, respect is one. Not on honesty, they know because the rules still apply. If they lie, they're done. That's still, that's still that rule didn't go away. So if you fly, you're fired. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But, so honesty is not a problem, but respect is one. And what do you think the other one is? Perseverance. No, they're they they're, pers they're very persistent. They're not. That's not going to be a problem. So, not integrity either. And integrity, okay, honestly, integrity is hard to judge. I can't. I don't always know whether a guy's what a guy's level of integrity is because I don't always know what his belief system is, right? So, 
That's sometimes that, that's a really internal one. It's hard to tell. Servant leadership. And I'll tell you why. Respect is not about respecting others. They feel disrespected. Pilots have a real bad problem of feeling like somebody is trying to take advantage of them. That's just the this wiring in pilots. Okay, they feel like they're being dissed. The other thing, even when, even when they're not, they're totally not, but they think that they are. The other one is servant leadership. Okay? Pilots have a tendency to when they get, just like any other human being, when they get a little power, they get a little bit of position, they tend to look down on other people. Especially when they become instructors, and now they feel like they are now part of the 600, or part of the 40, and not part of the 14,000. Look at me, I am somebody, right? So when I deal with instructors, this idea of servant leadership is an issue that I deal with all the time. And you know how I can see those two in those guys? How it's easy for me to see it? Because it's in me too. Right? It's a problem. I have that problem just like those guys do. So I'm, this is not like me looking at them and saying, what's wrong with you guys? It's something that I see in myself as well. This is something that I have to deal with because pride is nasty. And it seeps in and sinks in us sneaks it on you really quickly and can cause problems, big time problems. And it happens to anybody that gets a little bit of authority, a little bit of power, a little bit of position, pride comes in, and the first things that go is respect and service leadership. What I've seen, that's what I've experienced. It's something we have to fight against regularly with our guys aiming in my own heart. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at these individually. And I got some other few stories about these. All right, honesty. Mark Twain says, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything, which is a true thing, right? If you start telling, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we attempted to deceive. Once you start telling lies, it's hard to remember what's true and what's not true. In fact, I'll tell a story about my grandma. My grandmother lied about her age so much that by the time she was, time for her to go collect her retirement from Social Security, they said, oh, Mary, you could have been here five years ago. She completely forgot how old she was. She forgot so much that she missed five years of retirement money by lying about her age so long. She convinced herself that she was five years younger than she actually was. So I hope I don't have that gene, but maybe I do. So we have here um, honesty. Always tell the truth. All right, have it been here in Croatia. This idea is steep. Is that what I'm saying that right? Somebody say that. How do I say that? It's the new. It's the new. It's true, right? This is an important thing. Honesty is an important thing, all right? And I'm going to tell you, this is the first, this is Paul, and this area of honesty is the first thing that Delta did right after they changed the core, into this idea of core values, and it is shocking. And I'm going to tell you what they did. And I don't know whether they were happening on parallel tracks or whether they just happened to happen at the same time, but they did. And we have a program now called the Aviation Safety Action Program. So if I'm a pilot at Delta Airlines, or if I am a flight attendant, or if I am a dispatcher, or a mechanic, or any other position at Delta, and I make a mistake, I do something wrong. It could be like really bad wrong, right? Like a, like a nasty mistake. Like we had, um, I probably, it, I'll tell you, we had an airplane land, 767 land on a taxiway next to the runway a few years ago. <laughs> okay. We had a crew that was flying from California to Minneapolis, and they got into an argument with each other, and they forgot to switch radio frequencies, and were lost calm for two hours. The F-16s came up beside them, looking at, looking at, you guys, everything going okay with you guys? Okay. <laughs> Think bad things happen. Okay, it happens in the aviation world. Now, these guys didn't weren't doing it on purpose. They made a mistake. You know, you're operating a big, heavy airplane. You can make it's possible to make a mistake. I've made mistakes. I'm not going to talk about them, but I've made mistakes also. <laughs> so, what Delta wanted to know, what Delta wants to know is, why did you make the mistake? And did you make the mistake? For years, Delta wanted to know this information because they wanted to be able to take this information and they wanted to be able to use it to adjust training, policies, and procedures. Okay. Pilots did not, were not telling, if they made mistakes, they were not fessing up. They're not telling because if I tell them, if I, if I make a mistake or do something wrong, if I come honest with it, my job is in jeopardy. I'm not losing my job for this. We have a, the pilots formed a union. The union said, 
just claim, if you make a mistake, come see us, clam up, we're not going to talk about it. So there was this lack of information about what was going on in the cockpit and the mistakes that were being made. That information was not coming back to the company who desperately needed to know to be able to fix the problem. No communication. Shortly thereafter, we started this program, aviation safety program. I can, if I make a mistake, if I, these guys land on a taxiway, they landed, they, they went to the airplane, they taxied it to the gate, they got off, they went to the computer and they filled out a report. This is exactly what happened, this is the mistake that we made, this is how we made it, and they send it in. They have total immunity. They're, they're, they're not in trouble. Now they, somebody's going to talk to them, and they're going to ask like, what happened? What you know? They're going to, there's going to be communication that's going to happen between the company and the pilot. But he's not getting fired. He's not losing his job. He's not even going to be fine. Okay. There's this idea of open communication. The pilot's going to be honest with us. We're not going to punish you. Now, you guys, you can imagine when this first happened, the pilots were like, yeah, right. I'm not filling that report out. So it took time for trust to be developed between the company and the pilots. Okay? But this all is a result of this idea that the company values honesty and integrity. And so we're going to do things that have not been done before in order to gather information. We're going to trust that you're being honest with us, and we're going to provide the, and we're going to be able to use that information to make actionable, and we're going to make the planes and the systems safer. So that is a huge win. It is transformational, and other airlines in North America and around the world are following in the footsteps of this program. It's a groundbreaking thing in the aviation world. Um, honestly, talk about integrity. Integrate, integrate it. I can't even say. I, I'm terrible. It, it, Croatian integrity, same word, right? Integrity is doing the right thing, even when no one is watching. All right, so integrity is really an internal thing. So it's hard to know if I'm looking at people and I'm looking at the things they're doing. It's hard for me to know if a person is actually has integrity or not because I don't know what they believe. All right. So this idea of integrity is this idea of an integer. All right. So here we go back with math again. In math, you have integers, whole numbers. Right. Does that you guys make sense? You know what I'm saying? Anybody? When I'm talking about a whole number, this is a Greek word that talks about wholeness. Okay. For you to have integrity, what you believe, the things that you believe about the way the world works, your values, right, your personal values, what you really think is true, has to line up with your actions. Okay? If you believe one thing is true, but to do something else, that's going to be a problem for you eventually because you're going to have all kinds of internal confusion. You need to live the way you believe, all right? Otherwise, it's going to be a problem. So Delta wants this, and the reason Delta talks about this is because they want us to, when we make a deal with somebody, when we do some kind of transaction, we say this is what we're going to do, they want us to do it. So it's a type of integrity that our actions will match our words. Okay? There's also a deeper type of integrity that I'm talking about you, where your actions match your beliefs, which is really the integrity that we're looking about. But for, for Delta's perspective, if your actions do at least match your words, that's good. That's what we're looking for. Okay? Let's see what we have here. All right. Here's an example. Last year, I got overpaid. Not a little bit like my paycheck was double. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. <laughs> and I looked at it. And I realized it was an error. I was overpaid twice, double. Okay, what do you do? Will anyone know? What would you guys do? Go to Vegas. Go to Vegas. <laughs> Wrong. You can go to Vegas, but then you're gonna run on the rocks, you're gonna leave a mark of integrity. We'll wind up catching, eventually we'll spend the money in Vegas. Yeah, don't do that. So what would you? So okay, so let me put it let me put it this way. So you have a, so you have a job working here somewhere in Zara, small you know part time job, help me, and make ends meet, and you get overpaid by ten dollars. What do you do? What do you, what do you, this should be an obvious. Is the answer not, it's not obvious? It's not obvious. 
Report. Report it. Okay. Would, does it make a difference if it's five dollars over or a thousand dollars over? Does it? Does it make a difference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to who? I. It's first of all, it's harder to notice five dollars, and then second of all, is you can't really do much with five bucks. <laughs> okay. So that's easier to report. The temptation is bigger the bigger the amount. You think the temptation is bigger the bigger the amount? I think, yeah. And the risk. And the and the risk too. Okay. It's interesting. This is what this is where it, this is integrity. So it turns out that I wasn't the only one that got overpaid. There were several guys that got overpaid. Okay. Everyone reported. Okay. This is integrity. All right. This is. This is worth, so for me personally, I didn't report it because Delta's got this rules of the road thing that I have to be, I have to have integrity. I reported it because of my own personal integrity. My belief system says I, this is not money, this money does not belong to me, it belongs to my employer. I don't get to keep it. I have to, get, I have to inform him that he is overpaid. And then he can do what he wants. Either you tell me to keep it, <laughs> or he can take it back, right? So one of those two. This is an issue of integrity, right? But Delta is trying to drive this, these issues home. This is integrity. integrity. Okay, questions about that? Let's go move to the next one. Uh, okay. Respect. All right. This is respect is a weird one, and this is one of the reasons why is is because respect goes two ways. Right. So the idea that Delta talks about when they talk about respect, they're talking about respecting other people. Okay. So you guys know who Rosa Parks is. Does anyone in the back know who Rosa Parks? Let me just tell you, Rosa. Rosa Parks was a. Do you guys know who, who was Rosa Parks? Go ahead. Who was she? Well, she was a black activist kind of thing. I mean, she went to the bus and they told her to that she can't sit down. Correct. Yeah, and she yeah, she was a symbol. She was a symbol. So civil, civil rights symbol, yeah. right? Or okay. breaking it would be apartheid. Right, yeah, right. Well, so, so I think we quite had apartheid. It was kind of like it, but it was <laughs> it was bad. Okay. So just say that. So she says this, nothing in the golden rule says that others will treat us as we have treated them. It only says that we must treat others in a way that we would want to be treated. Okay? So here's the deal on respect. And this is where my, my boys, my pilots, run afoul of this idea of respect. We are asked by Delta, don't hurt anyone. They want us to respect people out of the gate to start. We, we give respect without, until someone is decided they don't deserve respect, and then we give respect, okay? A lot of people are concerned about getting respect. Like, I don't, no, you're not respecting me. So if somewhere into the, 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 the language is keep this idea of you have to earn respect, okay? That may be true, I need to earn respect, but my respect that I earn is not predicated on how I treat the other person. My respect for them is the prime mover. I respect the other person first, I respect them the way that I would expect them to treat me. Okay, so how does this, what does this look like in the real world for us at Delta? People get mad at airline people. You may have seen this on TV, but what happens is people get angry because they have expectations. I'm gonna go fly on an airplane, I'm gonna spend a lot of money, sometimes a lot of money, and I'm gonna get about this much room to sit in, I'm gonna get this many peanuts to eat, and I might get some water. If it's not bounced or rough or disturbed, and then if that happens, I'm getting up. And I might have a screaming baby next to me. My flight might be delayed. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Okay, is that airplanes have thousands of moving pieces with complex schedules. They're operating minus 40 degrees at 500 miles an hour. And the fact that anybody gets anywhere sometimes is a miracle, right? But people expect that I'm going to leave at 9 o'clock and I'm going to get there at 10:15. And I have a business meeting at 11, and it's got to happen. Their expectations are not always based in reality. Their map of how they're going to get their value, their map, their paradigm of how they're going to travel may not align with reality. They may crash on a rock. So it just may not happen. And they get angry. Okay? Here's an example of something that happened. You guys may have heard about this. This is the guy who was so angry he would not get off the airplane. Even after they said you can no longer ride in this airplane. And the police came and dragged him off. This was a big deal in the, in the U.S. news uh, about a year ago. I don't know if you guys saw this or not. This guy, they, the police came on and they just, he said, I'm not getting off. They just 
knocked him down, dragged him off the airplane. This was all on social media. It's very exciting for United Airlines. They got a lot of feedback on this particular <laughs> event. Okay? So, this is a big deal. Delta wants us to treat people with respect. Okay? So, in the past, but they really, even the days before social media, we treat the passengers differently than we do now than with social media. And we also treat them differently because of this idea of respect. So I'll give you an example of a personal story. We were in the airplane, and we were getting ready to push back. We were in Miami, and we were going to Atlanta. That's about an hour and a half to two-hour flight. And all the people on the airplane were on their way to Atlanta. They were going to connect for international flights to Europe, so it was that time of day where the flights were going to arrive in Atlanta around 3 or 4 o'clock. They would catch their international flights. Everyone was ready to go. A passenger got on the airplane who was disgruntled for whatever reason. I don't know. And he had a suitcase, which he was rolling with him. And he decided he was going to put it in the overhead bin. The problem was the suitcase was probably about 3 or 4 inches too fat to get it into the overhead bin. So he tried multiple times to jam it shove it, punch it, push it in. Finally, in frustration, he grabbed the overhead bin door and ripped it off the airplane and pushed the suitcase in and threw the overhead bin door in the, in the aisle and then said that. <laughs> so the flight attendant comes to me and says, um, the, uh, we have an overhead bin, it is broken. And so overhead bins break all the time, and I have a special secret trick for fixing overhead bins. I know what to do. I said, I'll be right back. She says, don't come back. I'm like, why? I turn around, and she's standing in the door holding the overhead bin. <laughs> holding her hand like this, and I'm like, well, what happened? She said, well, the, the passenger in 14C uh, decided that it was impeding his luggage, so it has to be ripped, he had to rip it off. I said, you saw him do it? She said, yeah. He ripped it. He was mad, he ripped it off. I said, well... That's going to be a problem. So now, he's not going to fly with us. That's the rule that the pilot can say is the person is not, is not is going to misbehave like that. He doesn't get to go fly with me. Sorry, you, you're going to have to go some, on, another, on another airplane at another time, but you're not coming with me. You're not going to, if you're going to do that, you can't, you can't go. So how do you get that guy off the airplane? How do I treat this individual with respect? Because he's clearly not behaving, not complying with what he should be doing. But how do I, in a respectful way, without creating this, get this guy off the airplane? Right, so, we've got, so this is one of the things where, in the past, I may have gone back there myself and said, let's go, you're getting off the airplane right now, come with me, right? But I don't want to get on social media. I don't want to have people, 10 people videotaping me having a conversation with this guy. That's not respectful. It's not going to go well for him or for me. It's not going to go well for Delta. So I have to figure out a way to manage this situation with in a respectful way. All right, so what do we do? We tell the people, hey, the door has been, we're going to have to leave plane. Everybody has to get off the airplane. Yeah. Everybody's going to have to leave because we need to have a mechanic come out here to fix the door that's been broken. So everyone gets off the airplane. The mechanic comes on. I walk up to the gate agent. I say, the passenger was in 14C. He's not coming with us. If he has a problem with it, you guys can talk to the police, but it's handled very discreetly, privately, and the passenger didn't come with us. Okay? The idea is that I'm, if I'm going to have to correct somebody, and you guys know this is true, just to be true, if I'm going to praise somebody, I'm going to do it publicly. If I'm going to correct them, I'm going to do it in front of the fewest number of people possible. If I go back there and try and pick a fight with that guy or tell him to get off the airplane in front of everybody else, now I've added an embarrassment to his anger, and it's a bad combination. How do you learn to treat somebody with respect? Now, in, in this case, I didn't respect him enough to let him go. There was consequences for his actions, but I didn't, ex didn't uh, escalate. Yeah. Escalate. Thank you very much. I did not escalate the situation. So I treated with the guy, treated the guy with respect that he probably wasn't due because of his actions, but treated him with respect anyway. Perseverance. All right. Albert Einstein. It's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. <laughs> Okay, very good. Try harder than all our competitors. Never give up. All right. Has anybody ever failed at anything? I mean, like, ep like epic fail. Yeah. Ep how did that like, like, oh, that was bad. 
I don't mean just like a test, but I mean like, well, that's, that will leave a mark on my, on my life um, kind of failure. Okay, so what, how, do, how do you feel when that failure happens? Do you, does it make you want to quit or does it make you want to like redouble your efforts? Okay, if you want to redouble your efforts after a failure, this is the idea of perseverance, okay? We have this new idea called grit. Has anyone heard of this idea, grit? Grit is a passion of perseverance for long-term and meaningful goals. All right, without grit, talent may be nothing more than unmet potential. How many people do you know that have awesome abilities but they just, they don't do anything with it? They don't, there's no, they just kinda, they don't get anywhere. They don't do anything with what they have, okay? So here's a story, I got another personal story. When I left, when I was in the Coast Guard, I've been in the Coast Guard flyer plane for 10 years, and it was time for me to make a change. And I, I decided, you know what? And actually what happens, I really want to fly helicopters in the Coast Guard, because helicopters in the Coast Guard was where the action was. You go pull people out of the water, you save them, you're like, it's like, you know, it's hero stuff. I mean, who would want to do that? But I wanted to fly in C-130s, the big orange and white airplane that you saw before, which was not exactly what I wanted to do. So after 10 years of doing that and enjoying my time, I decided I'm going to make a jump to the airline world. And I'm awesome. I'm a great pilot. I already told you that I have an ego problem, right? So I thought that I was amazing and then I would get hired immediately. And so I applied to United Airlines. And I went, they called me right away and said, come to Denver for an interview. So I went to Denver for an interview and I interviewed and they called me back two days and said, yeah, no. I was like, Excuse me, what do you mean no? They said, yeah, we, we're, we're not hiring you. We're, you're not what we're looking for. And I'm like, this was an epic fit. This, this was another one of these things that left the mark. It was a paradigm shifter for me again, right? These happened all through my life where I'm like, apparently I was looking at this all the wrong way. And I kind of was expecting just because I, through my own arrogance, through my own, like, here I am, hire me, I realized that I was not, was woefully unprepared to go have an interview for a job. So I, through this epic, to me, which was an epic failure because it caused me to reevaluate everything, I had to then go think about, okay, and in order to get one of these jobs, I had to put a little effort and work and demonstrate a little bit of grit. So I did. Six months later, I re-interviewed and then I wound up getting hired at the job I am now dealt with. Okay. But when that happened, it caused me a lot of pain. Okay. So what I'm saying is, when you experience pain or failure, the idea of perseverance is that you push through it, you work through it, and you press on to the next thing, okay? Great, sometimes, now I'll tell you a story about my daughter. My daughter Mallory, my third daughter, tried out for cheerleading when she was a freshman in high school. She didn't make it. Now, if you guys know what cheerleading, you guys have cheerleading here in Croatia, you have any idea what I'm talking about? Okay. Cheerleading in Georgia is this, group of people who stand outside of basketball games or football games or other sporting events and they cheer, okay? It's a very big deal in school because if you make it, it's a very socially acceptable thing to be in. If you don't, it's crushing, okay? The girls that don't make cheerleading are crushed. I mean, it takes literally weeks, months for them to recover. My daughter tried as a freshman, <clears throat> didn't make it, okay? Sophomore year, second year comes around, she says, I'm trying again. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> she says, I'm trying. I said, I can't, I, I can't go through this again. <laughs> she tries again, <clears throat> doesn't make it. Epic fail again, okay? Two times she's failed now. I'm like, okay, we're done. Just you'll never do this again. Next spring comes around, she says, I'm trying again. This time I want to try out for a different squad, but I'm going to try it. And she makes it. And so the fourth year she comes back and she tries to get onto the main squad again and she makes it as her senior. Okay? That girl demonstrated grit for her to go and put herself out there and try and try and try and finally make it. That's the kind of grit that I'm talking about, where you just keep on trying. Okay? Don't quit, don't give up, keep moving forward. That's what grit is. Okay, Let's see. All right, serve leadership. And I already kind of said this before, this is a pet peeve of mine for our guys um, because, and you guys know this instinctively, right? There's leaders in Croatia, whether they're leaders in business or leaders in politics or leaders in whatever, as soon as they get a little power, 
it goes to their head. Okay? The idea of servant leadership is that you care for, or Delta says it, care for our customers, our community, and each other. The way I see it is that you look at the people who are, you're responsible for, whether they're my passengers, the guy I'm flying with, flight attendants, mechanic, the agent, whoever it is that I'm dealing with, and my job is to make sure that they have the equipment, that, they're getting, that I'm taking care of them. Their interests go ahead of my own. Always. And it's very easy for me to fall into the trap of like, well, I, but I'm the captain. I should have some special kind of privilege. As soon as I start thinking that, I'm, I have gone off the reservation. And it's easy for me to see it in me, and it's easy for me to see it in my guys. As soon as they start acting like they're disrespected, or they're not being treated fairly because somebody is not honoring them as much as they should be honored, that's a problem. Servant leadership is the idea that we put other people's interests ahead of our own in all situations. It's a leadership of, of helping people, coming under people and helping them versus you do what I say because I told you. If you're ever telling somebody you do what I say because I told you, that's not servant leadership. And that's not what we're going to do. Especially as instructors or pilots who need to be respected and treated right. Servant leadership. All right. Don't look down on anyone unless you are bending down to pick them up. All right, very good. How? Okay, so I give. You need to talk to this thing. <laughs> now, am I even talking to this thing? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need it. I don't. I don't think I do. Yeah. I'm tired of holding that. I'm just going that. All right, so how? So, so it's great. I can stand up here and I can tell you guys hey, here's Delta's. Core values. We got we got honesty. We got integrity. We got servant leadership, respect, and that's great. And that's really working for Delta. Okay, our profitability, the way that we engage with passengers, the way that we engage with each other as employees has been changing, and they continue to pound this into our heads when we're starting to believe that these are these values that they have assigned to us are true about us. Which is, which is really kind of an interesting development. You know, that people, if you begin to hear it over and over and over again, you begin to assimilate that into your identity. Okay? So let's take a look at the next. Here's the idea again, when I'm talking about that. Aristotle. You guys heard of Aristotle? He's Greek. It's all Greek to me. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Okay? So what Delta is trying to do with their employees is enforce these values so that they become habit form. So we, we hear it all the time. It's in the rules of the road. We read about it. Whenever we have training, which we have quarterly, we always talk about the core values. They, are, they give us examples of how we live by the core values. It's a big deal. Now, whether the guys at the way top are actually living by the core values or not, I'm not sure. But the rest of us, we are. And we, we bought it, hook, line, and sinker, and we're going forward with that. Okay? Aristotle. The significant problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking we, we were at when we created them. Einstein. As we deal with problems, as you guys deal with problems, as we all we <clears throat> got to think about how we're going to get through this. All right. I'm going to talk about a book here because I'm going to give you I want to give you some practical, real world advice, help, information. This book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, written by Stephen Coney, you can download it on your phone right now as a PDF. You can have all the information I'm going to tell you right now. We'll be in front. I'm going to go through this quickly, but I want you to know that you can have this book in your hands tonight on your phone and can read through it and understand it as well. Okay? The point that I'm trying to make is, is that Delta's core values are important for Delta employees and they're being reinforced by, to us by Delta regularly. You guys are not on Delta's email list. You're not going to get this information reinforced to you. Nobody's going to talk to you tomorrow about honesty, integrity, respect, um, perseverance, and certain relationships. They're not. Okay. In order for this to begin to sink into you, you're going to have to do some kind of habit forming core value development on your own. Sorry, but Delta's not going to do it for you. I don't think. Pretty sure they're not going to. So, what I'm going to do is I want to, I want to give you a tool. I want you to have this as an available thing you can put on your phone right now. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This guy sold 25 million copies. There's a ton of help get help books that are out there that are available. You've probably read some. This one's a little bit different. I want you to understand why. 
maturity continuum. Let's talk about, I want to talk about a couple concepts on this. When you guys were little, when you lived at home, when you were five years old, you were dependent on who? Your parents, right? For food, for everything. You know, when you were little, even little than that, you did this for everything. You had to feed you. I mean, you just, at that point, you're in complete dependence. You're dependent on someone else, all right? You are dependent on them, someone else to take care of your needs, okay? You are now transitioning, most of you, to the state of independence, right? Where it is about me. It was them, now it's me, okay? I am going to do this. This is the way I'm going to operate. All right? I'm looking for independence. You guys agree with that? You guys are moving towards it? You guys moving towards independence? You think college students? Yes, moving towards independence? Yes, you are. And that's good and healthy and normal, right? The problem is, for most of us, including us Americans, especially us Americans, is that when we get independence, we're ready to stop there. We got Independence Day. We think independence is the greatest thing ever. We are all about independence, right? That's the way Americans think and that's the way we are. And guess who else is like that? Croatians and Brazilians and South Africans. Everyone around the world right now is very big and focused on getting there, wanting to be independent, okay? But that's not the stopping point, okay? The stopping point for success in life is this idea of interdependence. So you go from you to me to we. If you want to be successful, you're going to have to transition from your independence to interdependence. Because the way you're successful in life is by working together in teams. And I've seen it firsthand with working together with my guys and building these teams together. Right? I can't do it by myself. I got 20 smart guys that we've, that we've looked for, hired, put them to work, motivated them, Servant led them. I wouldn't, uh, they're awesome. All right, we've got great guys because we just do, but we work together as a team. If we work together all as individuals, it will be a fiasco. Interdependence is where success comes from. Working together as a team. All right? Does that make sense? Um, I think there was an expression from the American Revolutionary War. We were hanging together or all hang separately. Right? We're going to come, we're gonna work together or we're going to lynch all of us individually. Right? So this idea of working together is an important, um, is an important concept, and it's part of the maturity continuum. It's something you guys should consider. Right? If everyone goes their own way, what happens? Independence can be a deadly thing to a to a culture, to a community. The Croatia, you know, Dami's been talking about it. everyone's leaving. I keep talking to people. Taxi driver keeps telling them we're out. We're going to Ireland. We're going to Germany. Everyone leaves. Who's left? Last guy out. Turn the lights off. Right? Interdependence requires a community, a culture, to work together to solve problems. If everyone goes their own way, things will fall down pretty quickly. All right? this, is not, this would not be the first time that's happened in the world. I'm not telling you to stay here. I'm just telling you this is this, I'm just telling you what's true about this. Alright, gold leg story. This is also part of the um, seven habits of highly effective people. Production versus production capability. I talked to a friend yesterday named Gort, who I met in 2005. He was a student. I met him walking around campus in Zagreb. He's now 32 years old. He's an electrical engineer. Married, got kids. So we've been, that means we've been coming here for a long time. All right? Gord is working. He's got a great job as an electrical engineer, and he's working his, can I say it, he's working his butt off. All right? There's a golden egg story. You guys ever heard the golden egg story, the goose and the golden egg? You guys heard this story before? Anyone have not heard of Goose and Golden Eggs? Yeah, the, the Golden Egg story. I'll tell you the story. The story is there's a goose. The farmer had a goose. The goose laid golden eggs. It was awesome. You got a golden egg. You can take it, sell it for good gold, make a lot of money. The problem was the farmer got guilty. He got no. He got greedy. The goose wasn't laying. He only laid golden egg once a day. He needed. Well, he started to have a nice lifestyle. He needed more golden eggs to support my lifestyle. He needed a new car. I mean that. I can't wait till tomorrow for the next golden egg. So what did he do? He killed the golden egg goose. He killed the goose, cut it open to get the golden eggs out. Well, there weren't any more in there. Okay, it's only come one a day, right? So be careful about killing the gold the goose to get the golden egg, right? So there's this idea of the goose is production capability, the egg is production. Alright? Old, old story. You guys have heard it. Alright. 
So what we're going to talk about for a second is inside out thinking. Okay, this is important. And this goes with goose and golden egg. The goose is the means of production. The golden egg is what you're trying to achieve. Inside out thinking, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, identity, process, outcomes. Who's ever tried to lose 10 pounds? Anybody here try to lose 10 pounds? How do you, and so when you decide I want to lose 10 pounds, what, did you, what were you focused on? The outcome. Whoever wanted to lift, whoever, what, what guy ever wanted to start lifting weights because I wanted to get bigger? What were you focused on? Outcomes. What happens to us as, a, as human beings, what we do is we focus on outcomes. What do I want to be? What, do, what outcomes do I want? What we don't focus on is the means of production, or our, for us, since we're not geese, our identity. Okay? The sooner we begin to think about getting to here this way, instead of starting with, what do I want? We need to start thinking about changing our identity. And when I say our identity, it's our values. Okay? What we talked about before, our values. What do you see? How do you perceive the world? How do you look at the world? How do you see yourself? What's your identity? This is a critical thing for all of us. So I want you to think about this right now. Who are you? What do you want to be? I'm not talking about just losing 10 pounds. I'm talking about do you want to be fit? Do you... Or, or do you just want to lose 10 pounds? Right? The idea is we need to begin to change our character. As our character changes, the outcomes will come. If we focus on the outcomes, we're never going to change anything. We're going to, it, everyone's ever lost 10 pounds, how long did that, that 10 pounds stay off? But all you're trying to do is focus on the outcome. If you change your character, you change your identity, then the outcomes will come. It's an, it's an inside out way of thinking. It's different than what you're thinking, what you would normally do. All right. So in the book, there's seven habits. I'm going to go through them really quickly. I just want you to think about these. Again, you can look at them yourself. I'm just going to read them, and then we're going to talk about it just for a second. Okay. The first one is be proactive. Okay. You are not a victim. None of us are victims. You have the ability to choose the outcomes. Choose your response no matter what happens. No matter what happens to you, good, bad, indifferent, you get to choose. Nobody can choose your response. You get to choose. It. Be proactive. Take responsibility for your life. Have a one. Begin with the end in mind. Where do you want to be? Where are you going with your life? Begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. What do you? You're in school. You're trying to. You want to graduate. You want to get a job. Are the things you're doing now while you're in school working towards that? Or is playing video games for three hours every morning maybe not the best choice? All right, I'm not saying that don't ever play video games, but I'm saying is that the best choice of your time if you're working towards some particular end that you have in mind? Okay? Be careful how you use your time. Very valuable. All right? Put the first things first. Avoid crisis management. This is what I do a lot where I just get up sometimes and the first thing that my email starts pinging and I start just responding to emails or doing whatever the <coughs> We call it closest skaters to the boat. A lot of times, it depends where I work. That's what they put the closest skaters to the boat today. So we don't deal with the alligators are most likely to bite us. Sometimes we need to be working on things that are not closest to the boat because those are the things that are eventually going to get us to where we want to go and not dealing with crisis management. Four, win-win. For me, for competitive people, the idea is that I want to win and you lose. Right? I want to win. If I win, you lose. We need to begin to think a little more collaboratively. I win, you win. We need to be able to figure out how we can do business together so that both sides are mutually benefited by the thing that happens. All right? Seek first to understand and then be understood. Okay, how, have you, how many people have ever had a conversation where you're saying something to somebody and they can't wait for you to take a breath so that they can tell you what they think? Is this happened this happen to anyone here? It happens to me. I, I mean, I do. I'm, Guilty of this, where I'm like, you're saying something, I'm like, I already got the answer. Please stop talking so I can tell you what I think. This is a habit that we need to begin to develop here, is the idea of listening and understanding what the person is saying to you, so you can fully understand what they're saying before you respond. Okay? 
Synergize. The person who is truly affected has humility and reverence and recognizes his own perceptual limitations, just like the guys from Indo stand from the very beginning. Right? I'm only feeling the leg, but maybe there's more to the story because everybody else around me is saying they feel a funny thing. I guess you figure out what else is going on. We should talk and figure out what actually is this elephant look like. And then seven, sharpen the saw. So the story is there's a guy out um, sawing. The tree fell down and he's sawing it with, he's got a hand sawing. Sawing, 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 sawing. And the guy comes up to him and says, what are you, what are you doing? He goes, Son, I said, well, it doesn't look like you're making very much progress. Well, how long have you been doing that? I've been sawing for five hours. I'm almost done. And I'm looking, I'm like, well, it's only like halfway done. I mean, it's going to be another five hours before you're done. How about we sharpen that saw? I don't have time to sharpen the saw. I'm trying to get this log cut in. I don't have time to do that. We've talked about this. I've talked about these guys before. Um, focus. It focuses on physical, spiritual, mental, and social development for all students. You guys need to be working on all four of these in your time. Why do you have time to do that? You need to continue to develop yourself on these four levels. All right. Last thing I'm going to talk about. Actually, I have one more thing after this. I'm going to kind of the same thing. But um, here's the thing that I observed about all this stuff. Um, no matter how hard you try, you get the Seven Habits book out, you can read it, do the things that it says, you can adopt the Delta Core values if you want to. And even if you begin doing it repetitively and setting up habits and stuff like that, guess what? You're, you're going to fall short. I got bad news for you. Doesn't mean that you don't try. You do. Do, your best, do the best that you can because it's going to make you better. But you're not going to be 100%. You're not. None, none of us are. Not, not going to happen. The most frustrating thing is that I'm going to expect everybody else to be 100%. I'm going to expect the people that I work with, the people that I buy stuff from at the store, people that I work with, I'm going to expect them all to be honest, have integrity, have perseverance. I'm going to expect that from them. But I'm going to give myself an out most of the time. Well, I don't really need to be honest about this. Nobody will ever know. Maybe I can just slack off on this one. I don't have to really persevere through this one. Nobody will ever know. I'm going to give myself out because I'm, I'm tired. It's really not fair. Um, this person did me wrong. I was disrespected. So I'm not going to do these things. We're going to give ourselves outs. Guess what? So is everybody else. Okay. It's a problem we're going to have. So luckily for us, there's this thing called grace. So as I look at my guys, and I know they're going to make mistakes. The guys, that I, the guys that I work with, the guys that I'm training on, know they're going to fall short on being good servant leaders. Well, me too. Me too. So I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to say, hey, you're, you're getting a little uppity right there. You're going to have to knock that out. But I'm not doing it because they're getting uppity. I'm going to do it because I want them to be better. Right? So there's this idea that I'm going to extend them the same grace because I'm going to do the same thing wrong as that, that they are. The same problem. I hope somebody that's up to me is going to say the same thing to me. Hey, Jim, you're, you're a little bit out of the line. This idea of grace is an important thing because in life, we're never going to, we're never going to be perfect. Somebody's going to have to forgive us. We're going to have to have somebody to kind of cut us some slack. And not only cut us slack, grace is the idea of not only not being punished for what we've done, but somebody kind of not only doesn't punish us, but gives us a positive feedback, gives us something that we didn't expect. So the idea of grace is, okay? So um, I just want to, um, I'm going to show this one set of slides here in a second, but um, I really just want to say to you guys that um, your whole life is in front of you. you really, it really is. You guys are still in college. You got the whole, your whole life is in front of you. Take time now to really think about what you believe. What do I believe about myself? What values do I hold to be important? Is money the most highest value? Is my family the highest value? Is my faith the highest value? Where am I gonna put my values? What is important to me? What paradigms am I gonna choose for my life? And am I willing to change them as I kind of hit rocks as I'm moving through my life? Because you're gonna, me too. 
right? You're going to run into rocks, and you're going to have to say, well, I was thinking this is really going to work. You're going to have to adjust, okay? You're going to have multiple paradigms for different things. How you work, your faith, your family, you're going to have to figure out how it works. So be flexible with that. Be flexible with your paradigms, okay? And understand that they may have to adjust over time as you begin to become aware of things. We call sometimes I refer to these as blind spots. Like, I didn't, I, I didn't know I was doing that. Well, I had no idea. Okay, that's what happens when your paradigm changes when you begin to be aware of these other things. Okay, really important part of this for me was this whole faith paradigm because for me, my faith, my religious faith, kind of lines everything else up. Faith in God, my faith in understanding how it works is really critically important. Okay, so that ties into the idea of grace as well. And I'll be happy to talk to you guys about that afterwards, or any of us from America would be happy to talk to you about that other as well. So, um, use a watch slide. So, all right. This is an interesting thing. I'm going to show this. This is my, air, this is my geeky airplane thing. And I wish that we had these in life. Okay. In the center of an airplane, there's a thing called an attitude indicator. I'm not making that up. That's what it's called. It tells you what your attitude is at any possible moment. So you can see there's three different. This is the old style, old style to the left, middle style, and then far, more modern style to the right. The black is the or brown is the ground. The blue or the white is the sky. The airplane is a symbol, the orange symbol, or the white symbol, or the or the symbol of bronze to the, the right there where the, where the cross comes together. It tells you what your attitude is. You're either climbing, descending, or like in this picture, you're in a right-hand turn. It tells you what your attitude is. I kind of wish I had an indicator in life that could, could tell me what my, in, in my attitude is at any given moment, but I don't. In an airplane, you do. When you first start flying airplanes, you stare at this thing all the time. Your attitude indicator tells you what's going on with your airplane. Right turn, left turn, climbing, descending. You can maneuver all over the place using your attitude indicator. Okay. There's other parts, so the attitude is, but your attitude is not the whole story. There's other instruments that come in play here. Your airspeed, your heading, your vertical speed. Um, these are other instruments that come into play here. And the same thing on the right. You can see your airspeed is a strip on the left-hand side. Your altitude is a strip on the right. Same basic instruments, but displayed in a different way. And so what happens is, as you check your attitude, you cross-check other things to make sure that you're at, and though you're, and you know what your attitude is, your attitude could be slightly descending, but you're five feet off the ground. That's bad. Right? So you want to know where you are. So you need to cross-check other things. So you need to have cross-checks. So in life, I think that I want to know what my attitude is at any given time, but I also want to be able to cross-check maybe with other people or other sources to like, well, I think I'm doing good. What do you think? Right? So it's good to know what your attitude is, but it's also good to have somebody or something in life that is going to help you Make sure that your even though your attitude's good, that you're in the right going in the right direction. Up, down, left, or right. Alright. Next one. Now, in most modern airplanes is this computer. It's called an FMS computer. Okay? And the FMS computer's got all the data you need. You can tell you wherever you want to go, it creates like a it's like a GPS, but it's very programmable, very modern. There's an old school one and a newer one. And it has information on altitude, airspeed, heading, it knows all the courses, the approaches, anything you want to do, the information is in the FMS. Okay? There it is. You're a, there's a book that tells you where you need to go. Alright? Then there's a thing called the flight director. The flight director is the integration between the book or the FMS and the attitude indicator. Alright? So you can see this one. The flight director on the left is saying, pitch up and to the right. So you take, basically put the pipper, the little square thing right in the middle there, and push it in. So you adjust the airplane until it's right underneath that flight director. Now you're going where the FMS wants you to go. You have a flight director. In the middle one, you're right on course. In the far right one, you need to go, you need to pitch down and go to the left. Does that make sense? It's pretty simple. It's shaped in across. One is for vertical, your for your directional, and one is for your attitude, your pitch attitude of the airplane. Okay, so this is what it looks like. You can see the, in this case, the flight director is giving me directions from the computer. It's telling me which way to go. Same thing on this one right here. This one is no flight director. 
But you see that this one's got the pink on it. It's got a flight director. This one's without a flight director. All right? So pilots, over years and years of practicing and studying, stare at their attitude indicator and their instruments. So I can go from 35,000 feet to the ground without ever seeing anything outside by looking at my instruments, my attitude indicator, my instruments, and my flight director. If I program the computer correctly, the information is provided for me to get where I need to go. Okay, this is kind of how it works. Attitude indicator, standby instruments, the book, and then I follow the cross right to where I need to go. Gets me to the ground over and over and over again. Pilots trust their lives and the lives of all their passengers with this process all the time. I wish everybody had something like that where they would, they could, in life, you could know you could trust something so much that you would never have to even look outside and get from where you are to where you want to go. This is a great example of it. So, all right, I think that's it. That's all I've got.